All right, folks, let's move along to William B.J. Yehoda. Is it Yehoda or Jehoda? Cam? Jehoda. Jehoda. I've always heard it's Jehoda. Yeah, Jehoda. So, so he cut a deal with the IRS that year. He must have had some. The IRS was really strong working the mob in Chicago. I've noticed several references to IRS investigations. We did not have that in Kansas City. Uh, the IRS did a little bit, but they were not as strong as they were up in Chicago. Yeah, he, he met with uh, an agent, Tom Moriarty, who's a, who's been around and worked Chicago for a long time. He was a pretty well-known guy up here. But uh, uh, Bill Jehoda worked under uh, uh, Ernest Rocco in Felice, who was a real powerhouse going back a long time in uh, out in Cicero. And he his crew, a lot of these crews had their own little names, and they, they called uh, the good ship Lollipop. He was a huge gambling enterprise, you know, and they – Bought a house up in up in Lake County, which is north of the city. It's funny. This house they bought was actually the family that had lived in it. The son had had murdered the family. It was it was a murder house before the outfit bought it, and uh, they bought it and used it as a as a gambling den. And and after that moved out, they used it for prostitution. And they would park cars at a nearby motel that they ran, and then then have a, a, a valet service that drove them to this this gambling house and there was also quite a few uh murders that uh jehoda witnessed i'm sure he took no part in it he just happened to be standing outside of the house when they when they these murders were committed there was a uh was it hal smith and um oh i can't remember they got, they they killed somebody else in this home and they burnt these were guys who didn't want to pay street tax and they were gamblers who, who refused to, to give in. And he brought down this entire crew. I mean, uh, Rocco and, and Felice was, was, there's a famous picture of the day after the Spilatros were killed. And it was really the upper echelon of the outfits. You've got, you've got little Jimmy Marcello, you've got the boss, Sam Wings Carlisi, you've got the street boss, Joe Ferriola, and you've got Rocco and Felice who's, who's right there. These are the four, top guys basically in the outfit as far as at this time the 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 cicero crew had risen to the top that that was the powerhouse crew and so he was involved in those discussions because he was such a powerhouse out there with with fariola being the street boss so he was it, it really can't be that jehoda's testimony that eventually brought down this crew was really it, it really crippled that crew for a long time well, those people that went down in that trial have only in the last five years come yeah. out of prison. Yeah, we've actually uh, uh, had been talking to somebody. We, we've had the uh, uh, opportunity to meet. He, he brought down uh, 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 Robert um, the Gabit um, Bellavia and another guy who doesn't like to be mentioned, who runs a pretty successful pizza pizza chain up in Lake County. And uh, these guys went down for a long time. The Gabit was down for 25 years and he just came out. So, and Bill Jehoda, have, if you read his testimony, it is kind of, kind of odd that he was standing outside of the building and just looked in the window and they were committing a murder. And he just, he, he places himself outside of the house witnessing a murder through the window, which is convenient when you're the one testifying against murderers. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was, uh, he was involved in uh, gambling. So that makes sense. Then the IRS got him. Uh, and millions of dollars, millions of dollars a month they were bringing. And he met, uh, I don't remember Paul and you did he, he contacted Moriarty right? Or did Moriarty reach out to him? Cause he was under investigation. I, I thought Jehoda was, was worried about himself. So he reached out to them. I can't remember the details though. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think he was worried about his own, his own safety, Gary. And he reached out to Moriarty and they met up at a hotel just outside the city on the, uh, up in the Northwest. And uh, they, they talked about things. I actually found the location and on that little map, you can find where, where they met each other. But he, they met each other and discussed, and they would meet different locations. And and Jehoda wore a wire. And some of those, some of those wiretaps are they really make for uh, that? 
that those conversations come right out of the movie. Just, I love what we're doing out here and I love my job. And, and you actually, where I'm going to make you trunk music. I mean, you really hear these things that, that you see it right in the movies. I mean, you, you can't write the dialogue that, that these guys are actually using. It's, 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 you know, it, it comes straight out of a book. I mean, you've got, you've got, uh, this is the toughest dialogue you'll ever hear. Interesting. How'd you find, where'd you find that at? Is that, uh, there's probably not the audio in probably anywhere no. in a book or something. Yeah, you can, if you look up, if you look up different, different, you know, you go on newspapers.com or you go in, in different uh, mob oh. books, I believe uh, I've got um, uh, mob textbook by um, Howard Abedinsky. I've got a couple copies of his, of his textbook, Organized Crime, and he's got some clips of it. Uh, this guy who owns a, a pizza shop up north is talking about how he, he loves his job. He loves what he does. And um, it's it's funny to hear he talking about smashing somebody and, and loving what you do. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know? well, I, I, I've heard a few conversations like that back at the station house. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't care to repeat. Well, it's, it's on both sides then. Huh? Is, that what, is that what you're saying? When, when, you, when you live in that world. <laughs> Those guys above. can go either direction. Huh? <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's talk about ex-Chicago cops. Speaking of cops, let's talk about Vince Riza, his, you know, his daughter actually appeared on that uh, Chicago Mob Housewives, or they tried to do a show, and Frank Swish's daughter was on it, and Pia Riza, who has gotten some notoriety as a model or something, I can't remember, and she really, she was tight. She would not talk about her dad at all. I read an interview of her. She refused to talk about her dad at all. But he came in and he testified against Harry Aleman, of all people, and linked him to the murder of this bookie, Anthony Ratlinger. You remember that one? Go ahead, Paul. No, I, that one I'm not very up on, you know, Cam. I, I'm all right, sorry. So Ratlinger, oh. Ratlinger, I believe he, he I'm, 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 I believe he didn't want to pay his his street tax, if I'm right, Gary. And he, yeah, you're he, right. I, he had I'm been right. warned. He, Ratlinger had been warned that he needs to pay, he needs to pay, and he was making a good deal of money. And Ratlinger was, was he was brought in, he was spoke just the normal, the normal course of action with the, with the Wild Bunch because he was a Wild Bunch murderer. It's, I'm, I'm a little rusty, but, but here it comes. So he was a Wild Bunch killing. He was brought in, he was warned. It was the typical Harry Aleman. And uh, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly and, and people correct me if I'm not, it was, it was Butch Petrocelli. They sat him down, right. you know, Butch and uh, usually it would be Butch and um, uh, Borsalino who would do the talking, uh, Tony Borsalino, and they would do the talking. And then afterwards, Butch Petrocelli would just sit down and glare. So he was a pretty scary guy. And he had that uh, uh, Malocchio, the, the evil eye, and he would just glare at people. And that would send the message. And Reitlinger didn't, didn't listen. He was making too much money. He's not going to pay any any damn dagos. At that that kind of line, and so he, of course, fell victim to these guys. And I believe he was. He may have been trunk music. I think I, I remember on this the one, map, I, but I can't remember. Yeah, I, I got this one. It's uh, he went to a restaurant. That's right. That's himself. right. And, and he had already warned that's him. Right. I think his daughter lived with him. I'm not sure about the wife, yeah. but he had warned his family to take all kinds of extra precautions. Yeah. He knew something was coming. And, it, you know, after reading that thing, it, it's kind of like what we talked about, Scalatro taking off their jewelry. Ken, yes. Ito, Ken Ito did the similar kind of a thing and told his wife he may not be coming back. Uh, I tell you, another guy that did the same thing was uh, Sonny Black. Uh, after That's right. It came out about uh, uh, Joe Pistone and the Donnie Brusco story. He did the same thing. He went to a sit down or a meeting and he took off his jewelry. I believe left his billfold. Uh, when he went to the meeting, it's, and Ken Edo was the same way. Ken Edo, I think, thought he could talk his way out of it. I think all of them thought they could talk yeah. their way out of it. Yeah. So Reitlinger went out by himself and sat in a prominent do, place yeah. in this local restaurant that and was public. really well known in, up there in the uh, kind of north side, of, north of downtown Chicago, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, and, and he just sat there and 
pretty soon a car pulls up and, and two guys run in, kind of like a Richard Kane kind of a deal, and, and just start popping it. And, and that was a Harry Edelman deal. He, right, that's right. he did, I believe. He there's an old guy who was uh, who had married the girlfriend of uh, Felix Alderacio, I believe. And he, he and this woman are sitting out in front of their brownstone, and Edelman and some other dude pull up and get out with guns, walk up to him and shoot him and kill him. And, and so that was and had uh, yeah that was Petrocelli and Petrocelli and uh, and Aylman Aylman. walked up and yeah. he had been he had been dating uh, uh, Aldericio's Aldericio's girlfriend now right. is dead. Well, that's the famous hit from Beyond the Grave. That's because right. You know, <laughs> yeah. Already gone. The whole Sambo's just sitting in the lawn chair thinking he's got it made. That's right. You know, Gary, you and I did the show on the outfit uh, uh, a long time ago. Uh, not, I'm sorry, on the Wild Bunch a long time ago. So a lot of those, and they did so much work back in the day. A lot of those run together. But yeah, you now, now that you're right, writing or was he was eating in uh, in uh, uh, the restaurant. I uh, I can't remember the name. It may have been been Luna's, but he was went out in public. He thought he'd be safe. And like you said, a lot of these guys have a sixth sense because they come up on the street and they know these things. And uh, like a guy like Sammy Anarino knew it was coming. He was dodging them for a long time, but they, they know that their time is coming. Eventually they just, they stay ahead of it for a while and figure they can fight their way out or, or talk their way out. And yeah, they, he was blown away right in public. It was similar to the, I remember it being similar to the, to the Richard Kane murder. And this was in, it was right around the same time. It was, it was in the mid seventies, 75, 74, 75, 76. It might have been 75 that writing her happened right right in the middle of the restaurant. It have been a lot cheaper to pay the street tax, I reckon. You know, and it wasn't, I, I don't recall that they were asking for so much, but once these murders started happening, yeah, I think it, was, it wasn't like it was half or, or 75%. I think they just wanted, it was, you know, it, it might have been a quarter. It might have just been a flat fee across the board, but once that street tax was was instituted, I mean, you, we've talked about this before, Gary. That was when the Wild Bunch was out there. That was that was they really didn't play around. When Ferriola told these guys get everybody in line, uh, uh, they really cracked down, and they they weren't playing at all. You you pay or you die. And guys like Alem and, and Petricelli, you know, right, whether it was right in public or whatever, in the outfit in the 70s, you know, Paul, you know this from from Richard Kane and, and several others, they just write in public, which just blow you away. And uh, Reitinger was just was almost textbook, just like the Richard Kane. It was it was right in the right in the restaurant. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I, think I was thinking of I was con I was conflating him with with Hal Smith. OK, I, I'll tell you something about those mob hits, but when they kill somebody in public like that in a public way, more than likely it's because they, the, whoever the victim is, has been alerted and they can't get anybody to get close to them. They will have already tried to send somebody around to get them isolated. And if, when they can't get them isolated, then they, if they want them bad enough, they'll just lay, as, as Frank Calabrese, heard, I heard him say once, will lay on them. And I thought, well, that's interesting. We'll lay on them. I read that somewhere else. They use that term when you're following somebody and you're trying to set them up for a hit. They lay on them. Calabrese even said, you know, you're like, get an empty refrigerator box and hide inside of it. I mean, it's just like kind of stuff we used to do in the intelligence unit to, to do run surveillances on people. And so they'll lay on you for a while and, until they can get you somewhat isolated. If they can't, then they'll just take you out in public. Now, it might be to send a message, but I don't think so because it's so risky to get somebody in public. And you could have a, a, a young off-duty cop in there that you didn't even notice, and he come out comes out blazing, and, and you know it's just it's not worth it. Even even if you take him out, he's probably going to get you. So uh, it, it's all kind of the last resort. That desperation. Public. Yeah, it's desperation because they can't get you isolated. You you look at some of these public murders, guys like guys like Richard Kane or, or writing or like you said, who was who was on the watch, Sam Anarino, who was who was right on, on Cicero, um, a guy like Chris Carty, who was years later. Uh, I mean, these are guys who would have been, you know, who would have been smart enough and street smart enough to 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 be on the watch, to 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 watch their step, to, to know what was going on, with the exception of a guy like um, Michael Cagnoni, who who just happened to be difficult to get. Uh, and he would he probably 
might have had an idea that something was happening, but I think just he was a family guy, and so he was hard to isolate. Yeah, uh, he was. You know, they blew him up on the interstate, but I think that in general, that's a good point, Gary. These guys that they just run up and blow away, it's they, it's just a last resort. That's that's an excellent point. I, I had you know I'm, I have always been in that camp of oh that must be sending a message, but you with your with your experience, I think you're exactly right. One thing, guys, I think we're mixing up Sambo Cesario with Sam Anarino. No, I was I was thinking when they yeah, you're you're right, Paul. I was thinking though when when they blew away Sam Anarino in the parking lot with his family, though, they had been trying to get him for, for several months and they finally just they finally just went after him in the parking lot, called in a robbery and blew him away in the furniture right. store parking lot. That was what I meant. Yeah, Gary was referring to Sambo earlier. I just yeah. meant they had been trying to get Sam Anarino for a long time. And when they couldn't, they just, they just got him in the parking lot. Right. Well, interesting. You know, you, uh, no matter how much terror these guys strike in the heart of their underlings in the end, they still will turn once in a while. And I think people don't really not turn because they're afraid of getting killed so much if they don't turn because they don't want to have their family suffer the disgrace of them being a rat or a snitch. Uh, I think that's I think that's more important to be a man and go out like a man in this subculture. And believe me, I live in a subculture where being a man and being a tough guy is more important than anything else. Uh, I think that's the most important thing that keeps people from coming in. Uh, you know, you're you're like a wimp. You're a puss. You know. You can't take it, can't handle it, can't handle, you know what I mean? You can't handle five years. I can do five years standing on my head or a tray like the dude told me. So, uh, you know, but even even with all that, they still, there's a certain percentage that will end up coming in. Sure, and usually they're people that either don't care about their family, like Lenny Patrick, yeah. or that don't have close family, so that they don't have it so much of that pressure that you're talking about, Gary, because you make a really valid point that 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 cultural value is so strong. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you talk in, in a lot of these small towns you see in, in Detroit where they're all family tied in and everything you don't see informants. I think they've had one Kansas city, as you said, Gary, you don't see, but then you look at a place like Rochester where they're all just lower tier mob guys that everybody was informing on everybody because they, they really weren't as, as, upper echelon sort of mob guys. So I think that, that, like you said, once you get that culture seeped in, you've got those families and all, there's a lot of factors, but if it's a deep rooted mob town, you really don't see a lot of, a lot of real informants. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you coming on here. Uh, people uh, out there, don't forget to, uh, Oh, don't forget to uh, rent my movie once in a while. You know, you might only, you want to go back and see it again. It's only $1.99 if you get the uh, SD version, $2.99 for the HD. And, and these guys here, Paul and Cam, they've got this great show with Joey Seifert. On, uh, tell us again about that show, Cam, the, how you get that. I can never remember how to write that down. I can find it on Roku, but I, I can't remember how to do it. So the VPod is a, is a straight streaming network. It's not uh, on demand. So you watch it just like you would a regular regular the TV program. There's a lot of, a lot of interesting shows on there, Chicago based, but uh, our, our program, we, we discuss Chicago outfit with uh, uh, hosts are Joey Seifert and James Forney. They, they put it on. Paul and I are the, uh, we also sit in there and, and provide uh, our, our uh, expertise and our, 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 mobologist uh, knowledge and we really deep dive into a lot of these topics that interest people about Chicago. We've had some great guests on there to discuss. We had both Seaford brothers. We've had uh, guys talking about uh, some of the the history of the black politics and gangsters in Chicago and we've uh, we've had Robert the Gabit Bellavia on there. It's really been interesting. We had Lisa Calabrese, I'm sorry, Lisa Swan, the ex-wife of Frank Calabrese Jr., who I'm also writing a book about right now uh, in the end stages of editing and and we'll send off to the publisher here within the next uh, couple months. Uh, we, it's a really excellent opportunity to, to 
learn a lot of interesting facts. We got a lot of good dialogue going on, but it's on Roku. It streams on, on in Chicago, it's a 51.9, but, but that Roku is really the best way to get it from 8.30 to 9.30 East uh, Central, 9.30 to 10.30 Eastern. Friday, night. Friday, Friday and Saturday night. Friday and Saturday night, okay. Okay, I think that's done it for me. Anything else you need to promote? Anything upcoming that you want to talk about? Soon, soon. Just yeah, now. that's right. Soon. That's right. We are we are working on uh, uh, some interesting projects, okay. so we uh, right, we will cool. soon. All right, cool. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gary. Absolutely. Bye.